Thanks everyone for joining us for the Institute of Politics at Florida State University webinar series. Today's webinar is part of our Celebrating Civility series that we're excited to bring to everyone here. And we really want to explore the 117th Congress with our uh, webinar today. The Institute of Politics was established in 2020 through an act of the Florida legislator and through the governor's office of Florida. And we're so excited to bring people together to talk about civility and politics, civic engagement, and getting people closer to the government as well. So I'm very excited to uh, turn the program over to our moderator, Dr. Michelle Wyman with the political science department at FSU. Dr. Wyman. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Michelle Wyman, Dr. Wyman and I'm an assistant professor of political science at Florida State University. And I'm delighted to have joining me uh, two uh, congressmen from Florida State. And we're gonna be holding a discussion today on compromise and bipartisanship in the 117th Congress. Congressman Neil Dunn is a physician and former surgeon with the US Army and a current representative for Florida's second congressional district. He is a member of the Republican Party. Congressman Al Lawson is served as a member of the Florida House of Representatives prior to serving in the Florida Senate and is the current representative for Florida's 5th Congressional District. He is a member of the Democratic Party. Both have served in the U.S. House of Representatives since the 115th Congress or 2017. So I want to thank you both for, for joining me and the Institute of Politics for this discussion. The American political system was designed from its inception to facilitate compromise. Compromise between the diverse factions within the body politic. As the modern manifestations of political faction, the Democratic and Republican parties jointly share responsibility for representing the interests of the nation. More often than not, media coverage and popular accounts of Congress focus on how the parties fail to achieve compromise or fail to be civil with each other, uh, fail to perhaps work for the good of the whole. Tonight, my goal is to move us away from that discussion and to give Congressman Dunn and Congressman Lawson an opportunity to discuss how compromise and civility have shaped and will continue to shape their service as U.S. representatives. So tonight I'd like to start with Congressman Lawson and ask why is compromise important? Well, actually first, is compromise important? And if so, why? Well, it's very important for the good of your constituents uh, to make sure uh, that when you debate it, everything is that you can come to a compromise. I was used to coming to it by serving in the Florida legislature for 28 years on the Republican House, Republican Senate, and Republican governors. And so we had 60 days to come together to really pass our budget and work uh, between uh, parties uh, to uh, bring everything to a uh, halt. However, Congress was a lot different, you know, in the four years that I've been there. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit harder to get compromised, but many of us, if you have people like me that that uh, came to Congress, I'm used to it and been able to work with my colleagues on both sides. And so it was a lot easier for me in Congress to work on both sides of the aisle. And no, oftentimes you're not gonna agree, uh, but we are not disagreeable. And so that's the reason why it's very important is because you know we own taxpayers now and we wanna do the best uh, that we can uh, for our constituents. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Congressman Dunn, please. Is compromise in Congress important? And if so, why? Well, let, let me start by saying thank you, Dr. Wyman, for putting this together. And also a big hello to my old friend uh, and my former state senator, uh, Al Lawson. Al, it's good to see you. Um, and we, we've actually spent a lot of time together over the last 15, 18 years. Uh, so uh, we, we are old uh, compadres uh, at this. Uh, let me start by saying everyone who gets any significant legislation passed understands the value of compromise. You know, the parties are not monolithic ideological entities. Even with a lopsided majority, you're going to lose your ability to control your legislation from your own party's extremists if you can't compromise on both sides. So 
in a Congress as narrowly divided as ours is, and a Senate that's even closer, I think compromise is likely to become a very valuable asset in the near future. With regard to civility, Congressman Dunn, is civility important? So that, that was great. I really like the fact that you focus on this. I think civility is the only thing that underpins civilization. Uh, people can only tolerate the lack of civility for so long. Without it, we become just primitive warring tribes. And the only alternatives to us then become the abject surrender of your rights or real war. And I've seen war up close. Civility is important. Thank you, thank you. Uh, same question, please, Representative Lawson. With regard to civility, is it important in Congress? It's very important, you know, and that's one of the, I thought that was very good when you asked that particular question because uh, uh, you, you want members uh, to really get along with each other and to have the freedom uh, to express themselves and, and not to compromise their position on certain issues. So civility uh, brings you closer together uh, so that you can uh, show to the public and to everyone else that you have the ability to get along with each other. Absolutely. Uh, both of you actually have a track record, an established track record of working together or at least voting together in the 115th and the 116th Congresses. You voted together 37% of the time in the 115th Congress and 31% of the time in the 116th Congress. Uh, please, uh, Representative Lawson, would you tell us a little bit about some of your past either collaborations or attempts at collaborations, especially those that may not be obvious to the general public or may not get media attention? Well, some of them that don't uh, get a lot of media attention, when I, when I look at uh, Hurricane Michael and how it destroyed the, 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 the Army base, Air Force base down in uh, Panama City, uh, that, that was very important to me, even though I know that it was in uh, Congressman Dunn area, uh, because I had represented Panama City, you know, for over 10 years. And so I've been to the base uh, so many times, and we really was concerned about what happened in those coastal areas, not only in uh, Panama City area, but down in St. Joe area, uh, Mexico Beach, and all up and down that coast in Franklin, uh, in Liberty County, uh, Taylor County and places like that because those are the areas that uh, was extremely important to the people I know and, and I've always known many people uh, in those particular areas. So uh, when, 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 when Congressman Dunn said, you know, we're going to have a meeting down here uh, to uh, see if we can get funding restored uh, to the bases and, you know, redo a lot of the facilities that are down there, it was, it was my interest also. It might not have been the interest of some people in Tallahassee, uh, but you know a lot of people still work there. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, I do everything I possibly could. So we brought the appropriation person down there and did visits and so forth. And that was just one example. Other example is uh, we're always concerned about educational funding. You know, how it gonna affect the university? What is FSU gonna get? What is it the branch campus uh, in Panama City gonna get? Because I was a part of Creek at Branch, Branch Cat with, at that time, Senator Dempson Barron, you know, make sure some students could get their degree without having to come to campus. So as a result, as uh, we work together, we want to make sure on those funding, and uh, we want to make sure, too, during these hard economic times that uh, both of us are served on agriculture. And so uh, to uh, make sure that we, we got a lot of rural areas, and we know that people uh, have been hurt by this pandemic. So as a result, you know, we work to make sure uh, that we have uh, uh, benefits, food assistance, for high school, uh, elementary school, and, and for people who are in need. And so that really brings us together. I think one of the uh, telling factors here, you know, I was friend with uh, Congressman Dunn long before he got to be a senator. I was really, uh, Congress, I mean, I was shocked when both of us came in at the same time. <laughs> You know, right. it's, a little bit, it's a little bit different because I've known him for a long time. I had the opportunity to work with him. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Dunn, if you would be willing to, to also talk uh, a little bit about collaborations uh, or past attempts at collaboration that you remember 
uh, with Congressman Lawson, especially again, those that might be under the public's radar? Sure, absolutely. So it was, you know, it was great to listen to Congressman Lawson uh, you know, put uh, talk about the time after the hurricane because that was a really, really difficult time, and uh, and he was Im immensely uh, helpful uh, to to us uh, down here, and and his he brought up those those special poignant moments, you know, where the the, the committee chairman of military construction appropriations, a Democrat, uh, and he helped bring her very much uh, uh, down to see the destruction, and uh, we got a huge win on Tyndall, and I want to give, uh, I call him Senator Lawson because he was my senator, but now Congressman Lawson, I, I, and you know, he did have a head start on me getting to Congress, but I caught, <laughs> I caught up with you there, Al. But, um, you know, we worked very closely, both the 115th and 16th Congresses on the Agriculture Committee, the one committee that we sit on together. And, uh, you know, that was a really special time. 115th Congress was when we did the Farm Bill, which is a once every five year bill, huge bill, very difficult to pass. You know, it's much more difficult than the average appropriations or NDAA or something. So that, that was, a, it's like tax reform to get a, a farm bill uh, through. And, and we both worked together on a lot of things in Florida, specifically what came to my mind was the, um, you know, the seasonal uh, crops, the Florida farmers, you know, grow a lot of seasonal crops and we compete with uh, Mexico, Central America on that. And we continue to work on that, that as a program because we haven't got everything we want yet, but we've been making headway. And uh, that's a very close relationship between our offices. Uh, we also worked together after the hurricane for the foresters and, and actually it designed and implemented a program that's never been done for disaster relief before, uh, the block grant program for the forest. And uh, that was a huge win for our foresters, really allowed them to weather that storm. And now we have other areas where, whose forests have been damaged, Louisiana and Sally, and of course the wildfires in California. Uh, you know, that they, they, a lot of foresters got wiped out and they're copying our work. And it really was our work uh, for the foresters. So, uh, so I think we've got a lot of good examples. Uh, and, and they don't get the kind of press that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that the drama, drama queens get, but uh, we're getting some work done up there. I have a very difficult time convincing my students that members of Congress from opposing political parties do actually work together on substantial and important legislation, right, for the good of their constituencies and for the good of the nation as a whole. It's a, it's a hard sell given the current political and media coverage that uh, the representatives and senators get. How, um, Congressman Dunn, how will you in the future go about identifying the types of issues that you believe you can work with Representative Lawson on? So COVID-19 is an excellent example of identifying issues. It's just really easy. I mean, here's an issue that dramatically impacted everybody, small businesses, first responders, families, just frankly, everyone got hurt, you know, hurt by, uh, by the COVID pandemic and, and the uh, lockdowns. Uh, so we know we had to do something and neither of us in the long series of negotiations got everything we wanted, but we're willing to compromise in order to get the relief to the people in a timely fashion. And, you know, we would both wish that it could be more timely, uh, but uh, we're not the only two members of Congress. Uh, so, uh, and, and not all of them are quite as uh, easy to work with as Senator Lawson. Uh, but uh, we do tend to be very, very close on, on all things Florida, disasters certainly, and, and a lot of very special areas. Uh, he mentioned education. We, we're really very close on education and, and a lot of infrastructure projects projects, airports, seaports, uh, things like that. So it's really not hard at all, especially since we have a 200 mile border, you know, that's in yeah. common. And, uh, and, and Senator Lawson actually represented large chunks of the district that I represent when he was in the state house, uh, including my, my house, my home, my household. So uh, we have a lot of overlap. Is the relationship, the past relationship that you have together, is it what facilitates the compromises that you're able to arrive at now? In other well, words, I guess I'm asking, must every member of Congress have this type question. of relationship with someone from the other party to, to get the types of results that you both get together? Or is it possible to do it outside of, of having had that established and, and deep, great relationship? So I think having a relationship, whether prior or developed in Washington, is, is always facilitates working together. 
and uh, and I where some of your questions that we're about to get to, well, well, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in that. Now we just happen to have a, a very and it's coincidental, but uh, uh, we we had a you know known each other for a long long time. I you know I was a supporter of his and uh, uh, when he was in the state senate, and um, you know it's it's uh, it doesn't hurt to to know him. I had him on. My, uh, I had his cell phone on my cell phone before we got to Washington. So, uh. <laughs> Undoubtedly a good first step. Um, so how does Representative, uh, excuse me, Congressman Lawson, uh, how does constituency service factor into your strategy for, for helping constituents? Now, that's a very good question. I tell my staff is that the most important thing to me is how they handle constituent services. Because I think constituent services is the one that keep us uh, in Congress. Uh, the reason why it's important to me is uh, during my days at FSU as a coach, uh, my father became disabled in flood. And he was really disabled from uh, World War II. And, and for years and years, they were trying to uh, get information. And I say this, uh, I want you to clearly understand it. Uh, and, and we just always, would, the family would always run into uh, a brick wall. But during that time, Congressman Don Fuquay, what we went to see him. Yeah. And Don Fuquay went back because my father's records were destroyed in a fire in St. Petersburg. And I'm sure uh, Congressman Don remember hearing about that. Don Fuquay was able to trace all that stuff back all the way to Germany. Uh, and uh, and to get away, my father could get medical benefits and, and stuff that he really needed. And so from that, I always told my staff, I said, you know, if you want to lose your job, I said, don't, don't, uh, uh, people, you got to provide constituent service. If I hear that you all are not doing constituent service because we're going all the time, that's the way you can lose your job. So my office always worked closely with uh, Congressman Dunn's office. And a lot of times we don't look where the lines separate. I mean, if somebody calls, we can do it. We just do the work. Some people say, well, he's on the other side or she is on the other side. But, but we don't do that. I mean, if the person called and said, I live out in Golden Eagle, he said, what's your problem? You know, and then we, uh, we said, okay, uh, we'll take care of it. And that's where my staff would change all up and down the slide in these rural counties. We don't stop. We say, well, I don't know whether you are in the right place or not. We just said, tell me your problem. Give us the information. We'll work together. And my staff usually would call Congressman Dunn's staff and say, we got this problem, we're gonna help you with this. And they call and say, we're gonna help you with that. So constituent service is the most important thing, in my opinion, uh, that we do while we're in Congress. Good, that's an excellent lead in uh, to my next question. Uh, Congressman Dunn, uh, as you already observed or noted, uh, you do share, your district shares roughly 200 miles, right? If you draw it out on the map, 200 miles uh, with Congressman Lawson's district. And so even though Congressman Lawson represents one of the more urbanized districts, certainly more urban residents in his district than yours, and you're one of the uh, least urbanized districts in the state, you still represent many, many individuals who have very similar interests. And I want to know, how do you go about representing those individuals that have interests and ideas about policy that may be different than yours. Perhaps they, they voted for you know, the other political party right, at, you know, in the last election, but how do you nonetheless go about trying to represent their interests? So, so I actually, let me start by saying, I think our districts actually have a little more uh, in common than, than they might appear to have on, on the front end. Uh, you know, we, we, we do share a 200 mile border and uh, uh, he, we have the same problem that there are parts of each of our districts that are rural and parts that are urban, and they tend to have some ideological separation. Uh, but we both have enough of, uh, of, of each of those that we have to balance our, uh, you know, the, the, the groups of, of people in both areas. Uh, <clears throat> further, there's no inherent competition of uh, interest between the two groups in, in my district, and I suspect also in, in uh, Al's, that, uh, except along party ideological lines. They do not compete for business or real estate or anything like that. Uh, so so I, I find uh, it's it relatively easy to work with the 
the two groups, they can have their different ideas. And you know, in their constituents that do disagree with each other and with me and with the uh, policies. Uh, so, but, you know, we collect every single phone call, letter, email, and uh, from a variety of constituents. And we hear from a lot of them on our large teletown halls. Uh, and we treat all our constituents with the same respect and try to find the best way to address their concerns without alienating the rest of the district. And I feel like I could work with anyone who's civil, going back to your original question. I think Al said something great about uh, uh, how, mu how often the single district we cooperate with the most is not another Republican district. And I have Republicans bordering me in other sides of the district. It's Al's. And, and, and the reason <clears throat> is a close relationship with the staffs on constituent services. There's, uh, there really is, a, it's very hard to know sometimes whether you live in his district or work in his district or live and work in mine or both, you know, they have an interest in, in both of us. So, so we really do work very, very closely together with, uh, with people. And, and I would say the constituent services, by the way, I agree with what he said, it's number one. You know, if you can't take care of the personal needs of individuals in, in your district, how can you convince them that you care about the future of their, them, their children, their grandchildren. You know, that's, it's just, um, it's, the, the advice would be something like, I would give other politicians is, well, one to the politician that does not put constituent services at the front of the line, because uh, you won't be there very long. What I really like about what you both have said is that you are providing representation for constituents that aren't necessarily in your district, that, that means <clears throat> performing a function, a much wider function than just simply representing the people that are, are voting in, in the district. And I think that that's, uh, that's heartening. Um, looking forward to the 117th Congress, what do you think, what do you see uh, Representative Lawson as the largest barriers to bipartisan compromise in the 117th Congress? I think more importantly, how are you going to plan to overcome them? Okay, that's a very good question. You know, from my vantage point, uh, one of the things that uh, I always, I'm always thinking, the um, Congressman Don said early on, is uh, the resources that we provide for small business, like PPP funds, is extremely important so we can keep a lot of these businesses going, so they can, they can uh, not close and they can keep people employed and so forth. But the number one issue that we have to resolve is going to be COVID-19. Uh, we got to get a handle on it. And so there's going to be dollars appropriated, and there'll be a compromise on those dollars. You know, uh, the, the president uh, uh, asked him for 1.9 trillion. That's a lot of money. And so, but we want to make sure that the dollars are placed in the right place uh, so that there will be some compromise. And I can tell you this now not all Democrats are going to be like I am, you know, because I've been in business. You know, when I left coaching, FSU, I was in business for the next 34 years. And mm -hmm. so perspective on things is a, of a time a little bit different than other people who might not have been in the business, uh, making sure that dollars are spent in the right place. So I can always get in a compromising uh, position with colleagues. I can recall one day, uh, um, Nancy Pelosi uh, asked me, said, uh, Lawson, can I see your voter registration card? <laughs> really? <laughs> she, said, she said, I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, you're a Democrat. So I just laughed it off, you know, uh, because they would see me oftentimes uh, with a lot of Republican members. And I worked with those Republican members from the time they was in the House or the Senate. So I knew them well. So when I got to Congress, I didn't know a lot of people there, but I knew those people. And many of them were very helpful uh, to me in trying to get situated and so forth and so on. Because some people dig in. I mean, one's been there 30 years or 40 years or so, they kind of dig in. And so it makes it a little bit harder when you come to compromise. But I really think that we got to get our kids back in school, uh, funding for them because it's so important for education. Uh, to get control of this virus, you know. Uh, I checked on, I was telling uh, Congressman uh, Dunn a week ago, have you had your shot yet? Yeah. <laughs> so, so. I had, I meant to tell him, so I get a chance to tell him, I had my shot Saturday. Yeah. Hey, good. Yeah, because he told me I need to go get my shot. He'll be okay. You know, you know being a physician, he probably know a lot more than I do. But anyway, uh, that's what's important is we got to do something about this virus. 
uh, so we can uh, move forward and uh, getting clinics, uh, getting uh, uh, this um, everything out so we can get people uh, to take their shots and so forth uh, to control this virus so we can move on. You know, we kind of missed football season this year. Yeah. I'm just went in. And uh, basketball is going okay, uh, but uh, it's a lot of things that we're not able to do. And so I think that's number one. And I know that uh, our infrastructure is in great need, you know, and education, we want to make sure they uh, get funded. It's just, uh, uh, I want to tell you, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, Congressman Dunn and I, we released $186 million to university and community college in our area. That's significant, you know, because they really need it. I think FSU got about 65 million, our family got about 27 million, all the way down the line, the community college and so forth. So those are the things that are extremely important that we have, and I'm sure he has some other one, but those are some of the things that I think about. Excellent. Um, Congressman Dunn, similar question. What are the largest barriers to bipartisan compromise in this, uh, this current Congress, the 117th? And how do you plan to overcome them? And is it going to involve having your own credentials within the Republican Party potentially checked by party leaders? <laughs> Great question. Uh, are we switched over here? It seems to be stuck on you, Professor Wyman. Uh, um, I show that uh, I, I hear you speaking and okay. I, I see you, you moving. So it looks like everything's okay. Oh, okay, good. So, um, well, uh, so um, first I want to congratulate uh, uh, Al for getting his shots. Uh, I mean, I think that's important. It makes it, you know, easier for he and I to interact in person. So that, that's a good thing. I think, and by the way, he's right. You got to push the vaccines out everywhere. And, uh, and, 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 the faster we do that, the better off. Uh, I'm personally hopeful, and I work a lot on, on the uh, COVID problem, that um, we can, we, we had originally shot for the goal of 100 million vaccine, vaccinations in 100 days. We now kind of raised our sights to 200 million. That's a, that's a uh, you know, high goal to high threshold to meet, but uh, I think the more the better. I mean, because that, that's, that's vitally important to opening us back up and also talking to each other and getting together and working. You know, people are getting I don't have to go into the, the side effects of depression and the rising rates of suicide and abuse and things like that. Did you, you ask about barriers to the Congress uh, compromising, and I think the single largest barrier in my mind is the media. Uh, you know, they, they foment uh, disagreement, they, they love drama, and they don't really care for the kind of back channel work that uh, Senator Lawson and I do. Uh, another large barrier is a growing sense of division. I mean, when we're not like talking to each other, we're just talking at each other, the sense of division gets bigger. Uh, and, you know, there's an us versus them mentality, and that causes gridlock and even civil unrest. Uh, the media's inflammatory rhetoric reinforces the lack of trust between the parties. And I, I plan to focus personally more on bipartisanship than, uh, than ever. Uh, I do have my principles. I stick to them. Uh, but co Congress has to set an example of civility and understanding, uh, thoughtfulness, and compromise for the rest of the country. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, he mentioned the education bill. That was a great one. I should have brought that up earlier. We did. We got a lot of money for this, for the colleges and universities and state, you know, in the, in the, in the and that was, that was truly a bipartisan effort. And we worked closely with his office. Well, I get to see directly the, the benefit of, of those monies going to these schools. Um, so I know I'm you. thankful. Uh, thank you both. So each of you have actually served during a span where you were part of the minority in the House. Um, does being a member of the minority change your legislative strategy? Because you know it is potentially the case that after the next election, um, you could be in the majority. Uh, so does, um, does it actually, excuse me. Um, so does being a member of the minority change your legislative strategy? You're not in the majority right now. You're in the minority. How do you actually get things done? So I, I assume that question's to me. 
Uh, sorry. Well, so yes, uh, Congressman Dunn. Given that you are currently in the minority, please I'll, I'll direct it to Congressman Lawson in the next question. Pay attention now. Being a member of the minority makes it tougher. <laughs> uh, our party does need to work together a lot harder as a unit to push our priorities forward. Uh, it certainly does not impede in any way my interest in willing and willingness to, to reach across the aisles. Uh, fortunately, my district has a lot in common with other districts around the country, uh, including districts uh, represented by Democrats. Uh, and in fact, my own district was represented entirely by Democrats for over a hundred years. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, we could work with them. And I say that uh, being in the minority, you need bipartisan support in order to get things passed. So, you know, you you have to get used to that idea. And, and then I, I, I was, concede the, the microphone to a much more seasoned legislator, uh, Senator Lawson. Uh, so Senator Lawson, or excuse me, not Senator, Congressman Lawson. Um, <laughs> I've got her saying it now. Or no, 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 Senator. No. <laughs> uh, but no, now, now you as uh, Congressman. Um, so uh, there's a political scientist, Paul Pearson, who's observed that political actors must anticipate that their political rivals are soon going to control the reins of government. And given that uh, you're currently part of the majority in the House right now, does the reality that you might be in the minority after this next election, does it affect how you conduct legislative business when you do, uh, when you do have the majority? You know, I might be a little bit different than most uh, by answering this question because uh, when Ryan was speaker and we was in a minority, I worried the hell out of him about doing things, you know, as if I was part of the majority. <laughs> so, so especially when we had all the flooding down in Jacksonville and stuff and brought him down and brought uh, 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 Senator Rubio down uh, too on a lot of issues that was being affected with housing uh, and some of these housing companies that uh, created a bad situation in, in the minority communities and so forth. And so I just kept working with them because I was used to working. Like maybe some Democratic members would uh, step back. But what makes sometimes good legislation? When the two parties are closer, and that's what we have now, it lends itself to more compromise and more people to try to work together. I mean, if you, I remember uh, when I was in the Florida legislature, the Democrats had been in control for 125 years. Until those numbers moved closer together, uh, and with uh, John Thrasher, and Jim Kane, you know, uh, they took uh, uh, in control, uh, things really changed, but I, you had been used to working with them. Uh, uh, when I was on the selection committee uh, for the president, when John Thrasher came in, uh, a lot of faculty members, especially in music and English department and stuff, they were really concerned because they wanted academic mission. I told him I had worked with this guy and he really cared about the university, about your department, so forth. About a year later before they could see that was really reality. And those same faculty members came and apologized. That was fine. So I really think that uh, I'm concerned about what policy we found a passing majority and how it affect Congressman Dunn, because those are my people too. You know, uh, I get calls from them uh, all the time. And so and plus, I'm concerned about uh, whether you're Republican uh, a Democrat and you come from a large city, uh, what you do there might affect us in these rural areas. And so I might be closer to Congressman Dunn on some issues than I am to someone coming out of New York, uh, from California, uh, and stuff of this nature. And so you kind of pull yourself in line with the kind of people that you represent. So, you know, I'm happy to be in a majority, you know, this time, it, you know, but it might not always be that way. And so I understand it. So I have friends on the other side. So I expect the same thing out of Congressman Dunn. If we don't make it, next time you're going to take care of me. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Dunn, when you were part of the major majority, how much was it in your mind that, you know, the reins of control of government are going to shift? Uh, how much did you think about um, having to, um, make deals with the other party when you're eventually potentially in the minority. Did that occur to you at the time? 
we actively had to make deals with the minority, even when I was in the majority, because we don't have a monolithic ideological party. We have, you know, we have our centrist and, and as you get out towards the wings, you know, they're getting to look so, you know, much different, more different from me than perhaps Senator Lawson. I keep calling him Senator, I can't help myself. <laughs> Senator Lawson. Uh, but, uh, the, um, you know, he, he's absolutely right. You always have to know everyone is destined to be in the minority sooner or later. I mean, so, you know, permanent, permanent super majorities and, uh, and uh, majorities don't historically just are, are rare. So I would, I would suggest uh, that, uh, you know, if you remember the days when, even when in the house, the U S house had like for 60 or 70 years, they had a Democrat majority uh, in the house, but, those Democrats, a lot of them were very centrist people. And uh, so the country ran quite well. And, uh, you know, we felt like we, they were compromising. We were compromised. Think about Reagan and Tip and Neal and mm -hmm. all the great things they did. I, you know, so, uh, so I think it, you have to be like that. The other thing is when, when you're, <clears throat> you know, you get the feeling like, okay, we're the majority. We can do anything we want. We even have the White House. But um, it's important not to let the sense of urgency cloud your judgment. You still have to draft good bills that are passing law, not messaging bills, good bills. And, and, and you have to apply the same thoughtfulness to those pieces of legislation, whether you're in the majority or the, or the minority. So, uh, yeah, I, that, that would be my thought. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so you were talking about how Democrats actually had majorities in the House of Representatives for uh, an unbroken span of around 60 years. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how Congress has evolved over time beyond just who has been in control of, of either the House, the Senate, or even the executive. Uh, the rules and the norms governing the legislative process are very different now than certainly they were just after the founding. And, uh, and different than even the rules and norms governing the legislative process 20 years ago. Uh, so for example, this year actually marks the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Subcommittee Bill of Rights, which had the practical effect of uh, giving party leaders substantially greater influence over the legislative process than they had enjoyed prior to that time. Uh, so during the period where you have unit or where you have that unbroken democratic control of the house, you had much stronger committee chairmen and much weaker uh, party leaders. So there's this constant um, evolution of these rules and norms in in your chamber. And I want to know from uh, from you first, Congressman Lawson, which features of the current Congress, which institutional rules and norms are working well. And which features are you most disappointed with in the current Congress? Well, I think the rules that works well when you're in a remote, uh, minority, more than anything else, at this time, is the vote to uh, reconsider, the vote to reconsider, uh, recommend. Uh, it gives the opportunity for, uh, to bring that bill back for the possibility of amendment, to be debated uh, before you vote it on to make it permanent. I think that is. Uh, uh, it, it's very good. Uh, it gives uh, everybody the opportunity. Now, sometimes members don't really like it because uh, they want to just vote and go, but it gives the minority the opportunity to exercise the authority and create a lot of debate with the possibility that there might be a compromise. In some cases, it will be compromised. I've seen since I've been there. Because of that particular rule, uh, there have been some considerations to make some changes. But we don't have it all right. You know, and so I think if you had to ask the question, with you know, a lot of things have changed and so forth, but that's one of the most important things I think I've seen uh, that a minority has the opportunity to do, to recommit. So uh, Congressman Dunn, same question. Um, which features of the current Congress are working well? And which features are you most, uh, most disappointed with? So I'll say in defense of the current system, you know, team needs leaders. And, and the members need assigned roles, but that does not preclude the members from advocating outside their assigned roles in, where they have special interest and expertise. Uh, and, and, you know, they call it a Congress because we congregate and we learn from each other's opinions uh, and perhaps change them from time to time. Uh, you know, having strong leadership can be a double-edged sword. Huh? Uh, you know, it was very fun to me that you represented the, uh, you, you, you mentioned 
referenced, the subcommittee uh, Bill of Rights, which was a, a bit of history that we're actually very involved in now. Uh, and that history is deep and it's complex. It's like playing 3D chess. Uh, so for the nth time, we had a bipartisan committee on the reorganization of the House in the 116th Congress. And my principal contribution was a proposal to change the session schedule in a way that would simultaneously increase member time in their home districts and, and time spent working in Washington in session together. Now, it does that by decreasing the travel days and allowing us thereby to lengthen the session working hours and what had been travel days. There's a lot of travel days, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> this would have the salutary benefit of causing all of us Democrats and Republicans alike to spend more time with each other face to face. You know, it's just harder to hate somebody up close in person. Um, and another effect on that schedule is we spend more weekends in Washington, short weekends, but together in Washington, which would cause us to socialize together. Uh, it would also make us more available to our international community, our allies, for conferring. And Congress has largely forgotten its international duties outside of the members who sit on foreign affairs, commerce, and NATO. These, and, you know, if you don't do that, the mental muscles of international alliances and commerce, they atrophy. Uh, so I think it would be, uh, you know, a good thing. And by the way, we've had a lot of conversations with former congressmen <laughs> historically who recall when that was the norm and their those conversations reinforce my belief there's a professor at university of texas uh sean theriel who has done research on the lack of socialization amongst members of congress particularly um members of the opposite you know two political parties um they're not getting together even, in party. even within party yeah yeah well, so that's very interesting that you particularly have this proposal. One of the projects that I make uh, students do in my class on Congress and the presidency is they have to propose their own institutional reform, uh, justify it, argue for it, and you know, tell us what the long-term benefits are going to be. So I'll be delighted to have them see an example in the proposal that you just articulated. Be happy to share. Wonderful. Um, so I want to I want to move on with Congressman Lawson. Uh, so John Dingell, who's the longest serving member of the House of Representatives, has this, uh, has this really cheeky line. When he was discussing the importance of the rules, that is the rules of Congress, the rules of the House, he said, if I let, let you write the substance and you let me write the procedure, I'll screw you every time. How do congressional rules and procedures either impede or encourage compromise. I know you already mentioned the motion to recommit or the motion to recommit with instructions, um, but outside of that potentially, how do congressional rules and procedures either impede or encourage compromise? Well, you know, what really happens is uh, uh, the encourage of compromise would really be uh, not so much of the rules, but it will, it will be more of uh, when these numbers are closer together. You know, when we're going through the committee process and so forth, it's very seldom, and it might be, uh, I'm sure you my hair, but uh, uh, we haven't needed to compromise that much in committee, you know, the way the vote go down. Um, but uh, when you get to the floor, you know, on a debate, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a time when rules really come in, because you have people who are expert in those areas. And because they're expert in those areas, uh, uh, depending on who is in charge, uh, they can advise the leader of things that, it, that the leader can do and what they can't do, what not to accept, you know? And so that is a little bit more, it might be incomprehensible the way I'm explaining it, uh, but it's happened like that on the floor all the time because the person presiding gets the, uh, uh, the information from people who've been doing it for years and years about what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, I myself would never learn all of those rules and procedures, you know, and so that's when it really uh, makes a difference. And, and they're right. If you really know the rules, you can get a lot of stuff done. And it really comes into debate. It can force you on the floor uh, to um, 
change your position based on what are the rules actually say. And it looks like the rules to me change all the time. But I don't know whether I gave you a very good answer on that or not, but that's from my perspective. No, I appreciate it. And I, I can, um, we have a much wider audience that's watching this, but certainly within my classes, I can help explain what you're talking about uh, by telling the students a little bit more about the House, House Parliamentarian, about the, the rules. Um, Congressman Dunn, same question. Uh, how do the congressional rules and processes either impede or encourage compromise? Well, I'd like to start by associating myself. That's what we say on the floor. I associate myself with the gentleman's comments about let's don't monkey with the rules too much because if you keep changing the rules, it's, <clears throat> it looks a little bit like a fixed game. Uh, so I appreciate that, uh, that comment. I would say, so on the plus side of the rule, what encourages people? Well, uh, we do have a rule that, uh, or several rules actually, that allow for expedited consideration of bills that have vast, very wide bipartisan support. Uh, Congress can suspend the rules, pass a bill with two thirds majority, and that means no, you don't have to listen to amendments, you don't have to have opportunities for debate. Speeds it up, you can pass a bill. Uh, but if you don't have this kind of uh, consensus, you probably take four or more hours, could be four hours, four days, four weeks to pass a bill. Uh, so that's a, that certainly smooths the process in, in Congress and also allows for bills that have unanimous support, and some do, you know, naming post offices and, and you know, uh, certain things. But there's only actually a lot of things that have unanimous support. It'd be surprising. In fact, I'd like to see one of your students do a report on how many UC bills we pass, because I bet it's a high percentage. Uh, but you can pass a, a unanimous consent bill just without a vote at all, just a, one representative from each, each party. So that's good. Now, on the negative side, the rules make it possible for a single member to gum up everything. Uh, so one single member can offer a motion to adjourn, which requires everybody to get out of their office, come back and just, just to vote to keep us in session. Uh, also a single member can object to unanimous consent request, even hold up urgent pieces of legislation. And I'm not going to call out any specific one that came from my office, but it happened. And, and Al knows what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, it was the disaster relief bill got held up for weeks because of a single member, a couple of single members actually, that, that uh, you know, objected to a unanimous consent bill that, that had broad bipartisan support in both houses. So I think that's, that's, what, that's a bit of uh, rulemaking we could work on. If you could make, uh, Congressman Lawson, if you could make one change to the House rules, I know you've talked about the importance of, of stability in the rules, both of you have, but if you could make one change that would facilitate, better facilitate compromise between Democrats and Republicans, what might it be? Well, I think, uh, and I don't think that I could uh, accomplish very much with it, but, uh, but I really think, uh, it's similar to something that Congressman Dunn said earlier about the schedule. Uh, oftentimes, uh, where uh, we are in town for one vote and maybe there for the rest of the week, where well, you could be out uh, doing constituent service. Uh, but you know, a lot of that is uh, is done um, by uh, the the majority leaders. You know. Uh, uh, that they really have to come to some kind of compromise as far as the members are concerned. Uh, because uh, we spend probably more time away from the district uh, than we should. And they give you the opportunity to spend more time with people, the people that you represent, you know. And so some people say, well, that's why you got staff. You know, staff would do it. But people in rural areas, they really want to see you. You know, I think uh, the only thing I would, uh, I would change is the... Uh, uh, is sometime there's not enough time uh, for the debate. And, and most of the time, that is, uh, you, know, you might be given five minutes or so for the debate, and you really can't get all your ideas when you, you might have to yield to someone else. So I think it needs to be more time for debate on a, on a, on a legitimate issue uh, before you pass it. So I would say that... Uh, uh, I would, I would really want the rules to give debate, give the people more time on the debate uh, before sometimes they call it their vote. It's interesting that both of you are 
invested in and interested in the types of reforms that will allow you to spend both more time with your constituents and more time actually doing the hard work of deliberation in Congress. Um, it, seems a, it seems a tall order, and it's uh, one that I hope uh, Congress finds a way to, to fulfill. Uh, so I want to I want to move on now to actually uh, some questions that students submitted. I think that um, one I'm excited to uh, have you hear directly from our students, at least in, in the questions. Um, and two, I think it might be fun for you to answer uh, questions from students rather than from a professor. Uh, so, Congressman Dunn, uh, one of my students contends that Democrats and Republicans have such starkly opposed visions for the future of this nation. If that's true, why should members of Congress focus on compromising with the other side rather than simply focusing on winning legislative victories for their own team? Uh, so that's a great question. First off, let me say that I think that uh, what appears to be starkly opposed opinions on each side. If, if you look at the, the two parties, you would find that the centers of each party are actually not so starkly uh, opposed. And as you get farther out on the spectrum, you find that, that you know, a disconnect that, that is very apparent in the, in the news cycle, but, but really less, less apparent if, if you have to actually cloister with your own uh, party and reach, reach an agreement about something. Uh, I cautioned earlier that majorities are ephemeral things. You know, nobody's destined to be in the majority forever. So <clears throat> if you're focusing on uh, chasing a goal that is likely to be ephemeral, I think that, uh, you know, you're on the wrong goal. I think the goal was to serve the people that you're, who elected you and, and uh, to represent them now, rather than setting up the future for, from some uh, immortal super uh, community, uh, super majority rather. Uh, the, uh, one of the reasons we have a strict constitutional republic is to protect rights. And uh, so I think that uh, it's important to protect rights, even the rights of the minority. <laughs> and, I, and I've been on the majority and worked to, to do that. So I, I think that's, that's, impo that's important. You know, I, I know the media focuses on the hotheads in each wing. Uh, uh, the poor working stiffs like Senator Lawson and me, we don't get the same level of attention on the media. Uh, they focus on the anger and the discord, not the civility and the compromise. So uh, uh, thank you for doing this. It makes it so much your job becomes much more important against that backdrop. Represent, or excuse me, Congressman Lawson, it's the same question, right? You have students that are paying attention to how the media portrays uh, your political parties, right? They're paying attention to the most extreme voices and students that are leaving with the impression that there are only these two starkly opposed view and that there is no center that will hold. Uh, so, why should you focus on compromising with the other party rather than simply winning a legislative victory for your own team? What would you tell that student? Well, <clears throat> one other thing I hope that uh, you all can articulate to the students is that the media oftentimes drives, you know, their thought process on compromise and so forth. Oftentimes, it's their opinion. It's not the opinion of the leadership and what uh, how parties can actually come together. And I think more so than anything else, I hope students can understand that when they look at the media, they say, what is going to happen today? Well, we don't think it's going to be a compromise because X, Y, and Z and so forth. But I think that one of the things that we live by, you know, in Congress, uh, regardless of what you see on the media, is the ability for the leaders, our chosen leaders, to compromise and to bring all us together. And you'd be surprised our leaders, either they're the minority party or the majority party, when they meet in their delegations, how they talk about what we can best get out of this, where can we go? What best? Now, not all members are going to agree with it because you're going to have members who say, Well, I don't want to compromise, I don't want to do this. But we got to get something done. And so, oftentimes, uh, the media would take it and give a different spin on it. And students read it and are watching it on television and say, You know, what in the heck are worrying about all the compromise, you know, they're going to do it their way anyway. But they just need to know that a lot of thought, a lot of meetings, 
and everything had been put into it. It's just not like, uh, you know, uh, we say we go to Jaron, and the majority leader would say, you know, I got to go meet with uh, the minority leader, and we got to talk about all this before we go out. They don't see that. The only thing they see is when they get to the floor, there might be a little debate and stuff like that, and say, so we're going to go in this direction. You might see majority of Democrats vote against it, maybe 10 or 12 Republican vote with it, or a majority of Republican vote with it, a couple of Democrats vote against it. Uh, but that's the, the position of compromise, you know, uh, and you can still maintain your values, but we might know that this issue is going to pass, you know, because there's been a lot of discussion, but Congressman Dunn might say, well, Al, I can't really vote for it, but I know where you're coming from, you know, and I understand it. Now, he might get hammered by constituents, but, you know, that's what we have to take, you know, that's why we make the big dollars, so to speak. You know, <laughs> stuff like that, but, uh, but that's the way it goes. But but the students need to know that it's a lot of uh, discussion and everything really goes into it. It's just not like, oh, well, we're going to get them today. We got more votes than they got on the floor. It really doesn't happen that way. And I think they'll be delighted to hear that uh, the kind of the going intention is that we're going to get them today. Okay. Um, Congressman Dunn. Uh, what would you say to a student who has perhaps not just adopted an unfavorable view of the parties in Congress, but has instead adopted the view that the opposing party is simply evil or, or irredeem irredeemable in some way? Um, I have students that conduct themselves in a way that suggests that some of them do believe this, that members of the opposite party are evil or irredeemable. What advice would you give to that type of student? So that's a timely question, and, and it's absolutely true. I mean, I, I, I have those emails and I have those, you know, comments on, on Facebook that, that, that say that. I'm sure that Senator Lawson must have a few too, although he's such a likable guy, he probably doesn't. Um, but it's sadly true that too many people have adopted this attitude from the media's soundbite approach to information. I have found that wisdom and judgment comes from broad experience, time, and careful thought, not angry yelling into the microphone. Uh, and, you know, honestly, the media stirs that problem hugely. They thrive on drama, they thrive on conflict and extremism. So I would say this to you, I would wager that everyone in this room or all the rooms that you're are, are looking at this has a friend or a family member that they genuinely love, care for, and who is their polar opposite on the political spectrum. And I think you can generalize from that experience. It's true here too. Congressman Lawson, same question. What would you say to one of these students who again views the opposing political party as being composed of members that are, are evil, irredeemable? Um, what advice are you gonna give to that student? Well, the best advice that uh, I could give for the student is first of all, uh, is uh, to do your research. You know, uh, I think it's very important that you do your research and, and look at uh, uh, some of the things that the party stands for. You know, um, the Democratic Party uh, might be that a lot of people involved in the Democratic Party might have a more liberal approach uh, than the Republican Party. There are some issues that is dictated by me to be liberal, but it's, uh, it's, there's, those are issues that affect people in everyday lives. And so you have to determine how can you put a spin on it that uh, that it was it's the best thing to actually do. I think one of the things that is most important is uh, many of the things that you all teach uh, uh, in the textbooks is a whole lot different than the way things really function in the process. But that's the way it's supposed to be taught, you know. Uh, and so uh, I think. Uh, I've always said that every student in political science or some in history uh, ought to be required to, uh, uh, to do some form of an intern, you know, uh, coming into their senior year, whether it's at the local government, uh, either at the state level government, you know, uh, it should be a part of, uh, uh, it might be a DIS. Uh, uh, something like that is to get a first-hand knowledge, and I think that would help them in making a decision when they have to sometimes sit in, it might be difficult to sit in one now, 
uh, a committee here, you know, ought to come and work out a, one of our congressional office for so many hours uh, to see what kind of constitutional work and so forth we do. I think it was kind of changed uh, their philosophy because if they don't do that, you know, they're going to hear from other people that have their own opinion about these parties and so forth. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, parties are different. I don't often agree with many of the things with the Republican Party, but, but, but let me put it in perspective. In the Democratic Party, and not always with the Republican Party, but let, let me put it in perspective. The area that you live in, okay, my area in Tallahassee might be a little bit more liberal than Congressman Dunn area in Panama City, you know. Uh, but uh, in order sometime a person to get elected, you want to get elected, you have to look at what is the atmosphere uh, in those areas. And if I'm a Democrat, will I be able to get elected here? If I'm a Republican, would I get, be able to get elected? You know, and some people ask me sometimes, how do you get elected in all those rural areas, you know, where there was no holler African Americans there? But one thing I learned in government class is that you always cater towards the people values and not towards your values. You know, um, if you're a fisherman down in Franklin County, it's a whole lot different than being in Tallahassee. You know, uh, but you got to understand their plight and what, what they're concerned about. And so that is extremely important. So I think that they're going to always be proud, but boy, what America would be like in a democracy without these two parties. And that's the thing that you want to think about. The democracy is more important than anything else. And what makes the democracy good is a two party. And so, you know, you add two or three of them, but the main two parties that drive this democracy in the way that we have exist for all these years. One of the things you mentioned is the difference between what we teach students out of a, out of a textbook and um, the difference between that and then actually going and getting experience on, say, an internship in Capitol Hill or with the State House or with any type of perhaps interest group or lobbying firm, something actually involved in practical politics. And the way I describe it to my students is I tell them that I can only give them what the Greeks called a epistemy. I can only give them the theoretical knowledge of the thing. If they want what the Greeks called techni, which is the technical knowledge, the know-how, the practical um, way to actually do things, so you get things done, then they have to go out and have the experience themselves. And if they can't get that, then I would encourage them to watch discussions like this, where you actually have representatives, congressmen talking about their day-to-day -day job rather than just hearing a professor without the actual technique uh, talk about it in theory only. So I really appreciate that because I think it's something that students uh, desperately need. They desperately need to balance both epistemy and technique. Um, speaking of the students and getting practical experience, what advice, Congressman Lawson, would you give to a student who is aspiring to one day run for political office? I tell them, first of all, to get involved in student government activities. Because, you know, the students, I always tell them when I was at university, uh, they control a lot of money the students send them. You know, and they need to see how their money is being spent. You know, but once they start seeing it, it helps them a big deal. The other thing to tell them to get involved in is uh, in uh, any community organization, if it's just an hour a week, two hours a week, organization that help people in need whether it's food, food assistance, you know, whether it's some kind of social work or whatever, is to get a clear understanding of how people live. Because a lot of people come to the university, uh, they might come out of a very good environment, but they don't really know how other people live around because it's more poor people than they are milk class and rich people. And see, and let them understand that really the people who pay uh, and keep us going is the middle class. Oftentimes when I speak to students, I tell them it's important for me to have them to get jobs because I need to retire and I need them contributing to the retirement system. They don't even know what that means. You know, I need y'all working so we can keep the retirement system going so I can retire. So when they understand that, that helps them and say, oh, now I see 
it's not just the money you put into the retirement system. You have to keep the retirement system going, you know. And so as a result, I think that helps them more than anything, but it's not right there on campus. You know, have you ever been to a student senate meeting? You know, have you ever seen the athletic director come in and beg the student for more money for student activity fees? And that conceivably might happen this year uh, because they haven't been able to put no more than 20,000, uh, 2,700 people or so in the arena. So student activity fees become very important. You know how they're spending your money. And that kind of get, makes you a little bit more politically inclined. So that is a stepping stone to becoming involved in, in politics in the long term in terms of running for office. Absolutely. Congressman, uh, Congressman Dunn, what advice would you give to an aspiring, uh, a student aspiring to one day run for public office? Well, once again, I'm going to associate myself with the gentleman, uh, uh, Senator Lawson's comments, and I won't repeat them. I think that, you know, participating in student government and, and uh, charitable organizations and actually seeing how the money comes and goes is vitally important to know where they spend it. But I, but I would never discourage them. I, you know, I would tell them, however, to remember that, that when you get up to, you know, levels of uh, county and state and and national government that this is a position of service, not of privilege, uh, nor is it a particularly privileged life. You know, your private life becomes non-existent and any part of your personal history is fair game, no matter how remote. So I tell them they need to behave really well <laughs> and watch those selfies. Uh, you know, your family too gets dragged into the mud. Uh, you know, we, we're privileged to work and, and meet truly amazing people, heroic people who've done amazing things. Uh, and it's very, very rewarding. Uh, it is not, however, particularly remunerative. Uh, so you, you, you do want to make sure that they're doing it for the right reasons. Tell them, you know, look yourself in the mirror. Are you doing this for the right reason? Because it is a huge investment. If you're going to do it right, it's a huge investment of your time and your resources and probably your whole family's. So, uh, so I would, I would, you know, it is rewarding. I, I've really never had a job I, I enjoyed more. And I, I had some great jobs as a, you know, as a physician, you, every day you get positive reinforcement from your patients. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, that this job, I, I kind of feel like a doctor to a, a larger entity. <laughs> and, um, and I actually sit on the healthcare committee. So I got a chance to play doctor, uh, in my day job still. So, uh, uh, but uh, thanks. It's, you know, it's been a real pleasure to work with, uh, with Senator Lawson, I will say that. Well, I just want to thank you both for, for joining me uh, for this discussion. It has uh, served to give me a little bit more hope uh, in terms of my expectations for compromise uh, between the parties in the 117th Congress. And I think much more importantly for any of the students that are watching, I, I hope that it gives them a sense that they could one day and should indeed aspire to be one day in, in your positions, serving uh, in the way that you do. Uh, so I wanna again, thank you both for joining me for this discussion and for helping to, uh, to end on, on a note of hope. Thank you, Professor Wyman. Thank you. Thank you too, Senator. Yeah, I'll see you soon. <laughs>